Part 1. You will hear a male student talking to a union representative about placing an advertisement to sell a laptop. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories if that's possible. Sure, that's not a problem. I take it you are a member of the Students' Union? Yes, I am. Right then. I'll just get a form up. And as there is no one around and it looks as if it's going to be quiet for a while, I'll just type the details straight into the computer for you. Thanks very much. No problem. Shall we just title it Laptop for Sale? Yeah, OK. Can you describe it generally? Well, it's in very good condition. In fact, it's hardly been used. Why are you selling it, if I may ask? Well, I've got another one which is much lighter and I don't really need to. I see. What weight is the one you're selling? It's uh, 3.5 kilograms. That is heavy these days. Can you give more details about the one you want to sell? Right. Uh, well, it's an Allegro and it's got all the latest programs. OK. What about the memory? The memory is only 0.5 gigabytes. And what about the screen size and the other features? Oh, well, uh, the, the screen is, well, let's see, it's 37.5 uh, centimetres with a, a standard size keyboard and a touchpad but I've got a cordless mouse that I can put in with it if necessary. Well, some people don't like using a touchpad. What about ports or holes for attaching things to the laptop? It's got two ports. Mm. More modern laptops have more than two ports for all the extra attachments. They do. Uh, let's see, uh, what else is important? Uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the battery lasts for two and a half hours, which is OK, but not enough for long train journeys. Uh, but one thing is that it's not wireless. Right, OK, not wireless. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Anything else I can put on the advertisement? There's a webcam built at the top of the screen and uh, I can throw in a printer, a scanner and headphones, which I, I got with it in a special deal. It also comes with its own case for carrying it around. Uh, actually, the case is quite smart. I'm hoping these things will help it sell. They should do. Right, I think I've got all that. How much do you want for it? That... I'm not sure about. Uh, it's worth about £900 to £1,000 new. Yeah, but you won't get that much if it's used, and even if it's in good condition. What about £500? I doubt if you'd get as much as that. More like £200 or £300. If you look at the notice board, there is one on there which is comparable to yours, and it's not more than about £250, I think. As little as that? I'm afraid so. Shall we say £300? OK, put that. Can I take some contact details for the advert? The name's David Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. Yes, that's it. And uh, a mobile or email? Both, if you want. It's D-I-B underscore 7791 at hotmail.com. OK, and the mobile? That's 09 
eight seven five four two three three eight seven. That's it. If you send the picture, I'll add it and print it out and stick it up for you. Okay, I can get that to you today. Right. I'll type in here, advert placed the twenty second of October. Fine. And good luck with the sale. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. She's going to talk to us today about the pleasures of running her own business. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, and welcome to this month's small business club meeting. I'm very pleased to welcome Amy Lynn, who owns and runs a catering business in the local area. She's going to talk to us today about the pleasures of running her own business. Amy, thank you very much. Now, I started my business two years ago, selling very high-quality ready-made meals using all organic ingredients sourced from the local area, and I have to say it has been the happiest time of my life, with sales doing extremely well. I've had to work very hard, and this has meant a rather limited social life. <laughs> But I really value the fact that I'm my own boss, and I can decide what I do. You know, when I think I'm ready to try something new and creative, and when to continue with what I'm doing, and so forth. Now, I got the idea to produce these dishes when I was visiting a local supermarket. And I looked at what was on offer in the ready meals section, lots of low quality, unhealthy packs, and I thought I could do so much better. I discussed it with friends. Some of them thought it was a great idea, and others thought there wouldn't be a big enough market for such expensive products. But I went ahead with my idea anyway, and as I say, it's been very successful. At the moment, I employ two people: one to help me with the actual preparation and cooking, and the other to work on the financial side, doing invoices and accounts and marketing. My business is expanding, but I'm not ready to employ anybody new just yet. At the moment, I'm negotiating with a local organic farmer who would like to sell my meals at his farm shop. We've already agreed that I will sell in his shop in the new year, but I just don't know how much. It probably won't be enormous. My sales in total at the moment are only about seven thousand pounds a month, and at least for the next few months, I don't plan on increasing that. I think the thing which will make me take on new staff is if I just feel too exhausted and stop enjoying what I'm doing. And plans for the long-term future are a little vague at the moment. I've been thinking that in a couple of years' time, I'll start to sell on the internet. My sales will increase quite a bit.、Um, I won't advertise because that might mean I would expand so fast that I couldn't continue to use all organic ingredients, and I'm very anxious to go on doing that. But I think I'll need a bigger kitchen and packing area, otherwise we'll get very cramped. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty.
Now, I've emphasised how much pleasure I get out of running my own business, but of course, one of the quickest ways to lose heart is to try operating without sufficient capital. So, in the second part of my talk, I want to share with you how I got enough money to finance my business. The most significant part of my capital came from a grant from the Small Business Agency, or SBA, as everyone calls it. And this is how you go about getting it. The first thing you have to do is to draw up a business plan. Now, don't make this too long and complicated. I would say it should just be up to two pages in length. I've seen some people's efforts go up to 10 pages. Well, frankly, I don't think anyone will read it if it's that long. The next thing is it's worthwhile getting it checked. Now, don't rely on an accountant for this. Your best bet is to go to your bank and get them to look through it. Only if they're happy should you go ahead with your application. If all is well, then you should finalise your submission. Then your next step is to send it to the SBA. Now, they advise you not to do this by email, but by post. However, they say this situation might change in the near future. So, when the SBA receive your grant application, they'll judge whether your business idea is interesting, that is, likely to benefit from their grant. If they think it's good, they'll invite you to interview. And then, the successful candidates can get a maximum of £20,000. I got £18,000, which wasn't quite the top amount, but still enormously useful, as you can imagine. Now, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Dylan and Emily, discussing a presentation which they will have to make. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. OK, Emily, as you know, we've got to do this presentation together. I know. I'm a little bit nervous about it. Standing up in front of all those people. And what if the presentation fails? What if... Don't worry. I've been reading a book about giving effective presentations. It's not that hard. But the way to do it is certainly not always obvious, either. For example, do you know what the most important part of a presentation is? The final summary, I guess. The opposite. The first minute, in fact. The theory says that that first minute is when you win or lose the audience. If you lose them at that point, you'll probably never get them back. So that's why you need a hook. A hook? You mean like when you catch fish? Yes. I mean, not exactly, but yes, we want to catch the audience, right? So we need to start in a way which wakes them up, gets them interested and makes them watch us. I see. Basically, no matter how good our presentation is, if the message doesn't get across, the presentation fails. So we need to give a fact which really amazes them, or an interesting story, or pose a dilemma which makes them think, something they can really puzzle over. It's better if this is related to the subject, of course, something to do with management, in our case. So that's the hook? That's right. From then on, we'll just follow the basic advice. Like what? Like, talk to your audience, you know, as equals. Don't talk down to them, or up to them. They're just the same as us, right? 
You're right, you know. Some of the best presentations I've ever seen sounded just like conversations. Exactly. And what else made them good? Well, the speakers sort of involved me in the topic and issues under discussion by asking questions, by、uh, referring to me, you know, by saying you and well, basically they were interesting. And they're exactly the tips we'll follow too. It should be fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Emily, I think this will be a fine presentation, but how are we going to divide it up? For example, who's going to open it? You or me? Well, I think you have a very natural style, so you should start. This talk has five main parts, so you can introduce it and then do part one. That's the historical context or background to the issue. Yes, then I'll do part two about current views. You do part three, and I'll do part four, leaving both of us to handle the question time. I'm okay with that. In part one, I'll probably speak at length about Hoffman's theory about management styles and compare differences in culture in relation to the style of management used. That sounds good. Those differences are important and certainly relevant to the current times. Hoffman makes some excellent points too on this issue. That's why I'll follow up with present-day perspectives and viewpoints on this, such as the problems facing today's managers in the complex multicultural workplace, where basically one can no longer assume one is dealing with a single culture in the workplace, but actually a multi-culture. That sounds good, also. Then I'll take over discussing the implications and problems of this. I suppose you'll look at the pluralist movement. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but then I changed my mind. I've decided I'll look at the productive diversity argument. It's more interesting anyway, so I'll go with that. Then I'll tell everyone what we've decided is the best business practice, or what is most likely to work in most situations, which is basically ignoring pluralism and productive diversity, and linking everything back to Cotter's theory of human universals. Yes, the theory that argues modern management should target the universals of human nature. Right, and that leaves both of us to field questions at the end. Are there any questions we can predict so that we have some good answers ready about resolving industrial disputes, for example? Well, I'd say that industrial democracy usually surprises people, so we should expect a lot of questions about that. Yes, the theory is that it increases productivity and reduces industrial delays, and results in better decision making. But that's all theory. Most people would think that industrial democracy is just about unworkable in practice. So let's be ready to explore that issue in some depth, as well as any other related topics. Okay? Okay. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
River dance is an expression of modern Irish culture, but it is based on a culture which had its golden era from the sixth to the ninth century. Before that period, Irish culture was oral and based on a love of complicated stories and poetic styles. But in the sixth century, something wonderful happened. Writing was introduced by missionaries. From then on, the culture of Ireland began to develop in ways impossible before, and had considerable influence in northern Europe in the period up to the ninth century. With the invasions which began in the ninth century, this golden age collapsed, and there never was any real recovery. There were no wealthy kings to sponsor the poets and scholars, so the tradition survived only in a form which the peasants liked. The love of story and song did not die, but no real attempt was made to find a distinctive Irish style until the end of the nineteenth century, when Irish nationalism began to influence writers in English called Anglo-Irish literature. There are many famous writers from that period. There is also William Butler Yeats, George Bernard Shaw, and Samuel Beckett, all of whom have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. In all. Ireland has received the Nobel Literature Prize four times. When you consider we have only a population half the size of Beijing, you see how unusual that is. Now let me talk about the music. The Irish love of music has succeeded in surviving the change from Irish, the native language, to the language of the invader, and has once more begun to blossom and become influential outside the country. Irish music was reduced to being the language of the country people, and was dying out as people moved to the cities. Young city people did not want to listen to peasant music, although we were all told it was important. Some efforts were made to make it attractive to city people, but largely without success. More recently, this has begun to change, and since the 1980s, has taken off. But modern Ireland has been looking for more than just a revival of traditional music. Many of the most famous popular singers in the world are Irish: U2, Enya, The Cranberries, and many others. There are ten thousand people employed in Ireland in the music industry. River dance is an expression of that new interest in the old and that ability to understand the new. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.